How about that impeachment? <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So I've got a few quotes here. One is, poetry is a sort of homecoming, which is Paul Salon. And people are a chance for happiness, which is Jordan Davis. Tonight is a kind of homecoming and a chance for happiness on all fronts. I first met this evening's introducer, Stephanie Burt, at Oxford University in the early 1990s. And I first encountered Ron Paget and Jordan Davis in the early aughts during my first significant gig in New York City at Teachers and Writers Collaborative, an equal parts activist, equal parts creative writing organization founded and fostered by June Jordan, Muriel Rukeyser, Grace Paley, Anne Sexton maybe? Yeah. Uh, and Kenneth Koch in the 1960s. I prefer the numbers of the tw 20th century, writes Ron Paget. They all sounded good. At the prospect of tonight's reading, TNW's longtime executive director, the great Nancy Shapiro, sent me a quote about how good Ron and Jordan sound together, their collective contribution. She writes, TNW has a genealogy that extends back to Kenneth Koch, and Ron and Jordan are clear descendants on the Koch side. For decades, Ron headed our effort, editing hundreds of inimitable articles and books on teaching and writing. When Jordan came onto the staff, he was responsible for getting those books into readers' hands and was simultaneously Kenneth Koch's editor and secretary. While the opportunity to teach poetry to kids has it, this is her still, has its most serious side. I think teachers' and writers' work stands out for its playfulness. And Ron and Jordan, in their personalities and in their poetry, kept that creative flame crucially alive. I'm going to skip over some quotes from Charles Simic, which are wonderful about Ron, but I'm going to let um, someone else take that over. But I did want to say, back in the day, as my then boss, Chris Edgar, recounts, quote, Jordan Davis, fresh from Columbia, headed downtown and established himself as a poetry wunderkind beside Ron. He had read all the books and didn't sleep much. Without much ado, Jordan began attending several hundred poetry readings a year, started his own reading series, Poetry City at Teachers and Writers, published a slew of chapbooks, and began his ambitious project of writing one million poems. He was, in the best possible way, something like the bus in speed, an unstoppable force. <laughs> But before I become a one runaway train, let me hand the mic over to the great Stephanie Burt, who will introduce our two readers in equal magnitude. And after tonight's reading, you are all invited back to the poetry room for a reception to meet both of the poets. Thank you. I'm not sure where the great Stephanie Burt is, but I am Stephanie Burt, if I have a doppelganger. Um, so I'm going to introduce Jordan, and then he's going to read, and then uh, I will introduce Ron in case people are a bit late and don't know what's happening, and then Ron will read. Um, and should thank both of our poets for coming here from out of town and the Woodbury Poetry Room for making this happen, and Christina and Mary and everybody else for being here. Um, so I, I've been waiting for this for a while. It's an honor to give you Jordan Davis, who is one of my predecessors as poetry editor at The Nation magazine, although he did it all by himself, and, and uh, I only do half of it. He's a figure who continues and extends multiple traditions of the new, traditions we might also call part of the extended New York school, or extension school, or anti-school. I remember where I was. I was on a Metro North train from New York when I first read Davis's first full-length collection, Million Poems Journal, with its truly disarming premise and its internal delights. And I'm still walking around with parts of Davis's recent collection in my head. It is also disarming. It is also post-extension New York school, post-O'Hara, as well as post-Coke, and post-Wordsworth, for that matter, Dorothy Wordsworth. And it's one of many, many things uh, that Davis is 
and deserves to be known for. Others include a ton of editing, care for the works of Kenneth Koch, a ton of editing of Kenneth Koch, a number of chapbooks, a stack of chapbooks. I didn't know how many there were until I, I looked it up. Uh, and of course, the hat, not this hat, but the hat, a literary journal that was even more fun than what I believe was its Lower East Side Mexican restaurant namesake. Is that right? Yes, I have eaten there. The, the journal's better. It's fine, though. But, but the, journal, the journal was the best hat. And now, now we have, and you can and perhaps should purchase it uh, on your way out uh, an hour from now or whenever we're done, right? It's back there. It's back there. And you're selling it, right? Okay, and you should all buy it. Shell Game, published less than a year ago. A liability dressed up as a pork chop, part of my strategy. Great drama based on a movie from before I was born. It's got a title poem that's one of my favorite recent R's, Poetica, in which spontaneity and carelessness, hallmarks of later New York school-ish style, are not the same as each other, nor are they the same as a kid's pitch-perfect cup stacking. You're going to miss me when I'm gone. Also, there are otters. There are so many otters. When he emerged as a poet in his own right, not just an editor or a critic or a wunderkind, in the early 2000s, some of my friends thought that Jordan Davis was Flarf. And maybe he was, but he's not. And in some sense, I think he never was. He's having too much fun. There's too much of him there, or maybe just not enough anger. Arthur Hugh Clough was Flarfier than Jordan Davis has ever been. And though Davis begins a poem in the way of a parody that incorporates exact quotations with the movie preview classic line, in a world, he ends the same poem, I'm a liker, drinking a liquor not half so rude. He's also an elegist and is, all, I, I, is possibly, I hope I'm wrong, the only other person in this building at this moment who understands the magnitude of uh, the loss of the musician, singer, songwriter, and critic Scott Miller. It was a nice planet, Davis writes, and it was. He reminds us that good poems are never encoded adversarial puzzles, but they are at their best instead like people, and like people they're at least a bit puzzling. We want to get to know them if we like them, if we are a liker and we get to know Davis through Davis's poems. Skeptical, slightly circuitous, humble, funny. Someone we'd want to take perhaps from New York all the way to Vermont as long as we promised his million plus poems that we intended to bring him home. Davis graduated from Columbia University in the city of New York in 1992, I think, yeah? He's lived in New York for a lot of that time since, though he's spent a good deal of time in Ohio. His two full-length books are Million Poems Journal and Shell Game, and there's more to come. Call him an accidental country artist, says People Magazine, about a Jordan Davis who is not our Jordan Davis, but a different Jordan Davis. This Jordan Davis, whose poems I enjoy, is absolutely intentional, not accidental. Even as his verse cherishes all manner of happy accident, he's as odd as the world and almost as much fun. Please welcome Jordan Davis. Steph, that was great. Thank you. You're great. And thank you, Christina. And it's a joy to be reading with Ron, um, who has, since I first noticed in the dusty bookstores of New York and Cambridge, these and the libraries of Columbia, these uh, eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper stapled on the side and blue, and and black. And what are these? And <clears throat> Ron was one of the one of the um, signposts that led me down this life of ruin, so thank you, Ron. <laughs> Let's see. Come on now. Otters. So much of poetry is filled with stuff that fills poetry. Also, this stuff is so often arranged in a way stuff is arranged in poetry. We ought to get together and steal time from our jobs to put stuff in poetry that wasn't there before and arrange it in a way stuff isn't usually arranged. Click here to watch a video of otters floating, holding hands. 
Narragansett. The complete sentence narrates a satisfying process. It closes and opens like a clam. I take a knife to the sentence and start my evening at the raw bar. It is hard work, and the sentences would prefer to be in the ocean. I would rather be a patron of this establishment. Someone over my shoulder would rather know I'm going to continue to put up with his stuff. It is not a wide receiver, his stuff. It is his development, which is gradual. It involves testing me. Sometimes these tests take the form of imperatives. Drive onto the boat. The boat would rather be en route to Maine. It is an ambitious ferry. My knife wishes to whittle patterns into the enormous picnic table. Art does not narrate. Another negation. Ira will not be attending the meeting. When working on a small scale, he is practicing a gesture. So much of life is practicing gestures. So much of living is evaluating those around you for signs of damage. Now it is night, morning's a blink away. Sleep is sometimes thought of as an avalanche of repair gnomes that attends your pit stop. Would that we were sleeping now. Viable alternatives will be reviled until the point of no return is past. The only reasonable course of action is to look for sizable flotsam, redo the resume, learn a martial art. The moon is moving. High above the subway and the airplanes, it starts above the Bronx and finishes in New Jersey. It goes behind the rooftops as the bus goes down the avenue. It moves over the courtyard and shines on you as you dream of flying. It starts out pink and ends up yellow. Every night there is less or more of it until it's round like a clock. As when you turn to look, the second hand seems to stop. Just so the moon. The moon is moving. Route 35. If I can get $8,000 for this table, I'll start a university. We'll talk about the books and the movies, the paintings and the land and the Iroquois. Me and 20 people the windows look on from a busy street, the geese fly down. Words from Lily. Barbarism, batten, brinish, champing, delightfulness deter, driven, flip, gadfly, glaze, hail fellow, horse rider, io, lovebird, luster, midnoon, mubble fubbles, nunca, pian, plum porridge, printing press, quip, rough hued, slipshod, strictness, sympathy, touchwood, Townborn, waggery. These are all words the OED claims were introduced into the language by John Lilly. The names. One of the games we'd play in the beautiful sunlit offices of the educational publisher was Whose Book Is It? It worked like this. When you hear or read a singular phrase, call it out, wait a beat, then add poems by name of poet here. Many an hour of invoicing, inventorying, and inviting the slow destruction of our times, we passed affixing the names of our elders and our peers to imaginary titles, some functional, shipping not included, danger, high voltage, Palomino's excavation, statutory damages, coat fronts, and some crazier ones, as the day the eclipse turned, the dimmer switch saw us find five of our friends who might commit a book named Sun Throat Odes, Emigrant, The Difference. Chris lived around the corner then, the far side of the Fillmore East, and I shared my block with the assimilating Ukrainians of Kiev, Brewskis, and the sawdust-covered floors of What'll It Be, Boys, Lights or Darks. When the world hands you crackers and onions, you might imagine it all exists like Taras Bulba himself, to be written in a book and put into an M5 prestige mailer, coerced into place by post-consumer peanuts 
and shipped to the immortal United School Districts of Hagerstown and Kenai. You might if you were me. You might also imagine, though this is harder to believe, that the names of these poets, these places, these objects, stood for some accomplishment, a necessary mystery added to the world to replace the old, easy solved ones we chuckled about chugging our old foghorns. After our second pints of barley wine, we fell sideways to the floor. There, I should have noticed the internet money washing away the borscht halls, the Italian baby clothes stores filling up the dormant frontage, the thousand puppies of the bank where months before the crackheads considered the purchase of a Glock. Instead, I took my leave up the five flights to fall on my futon and dream of living, loving, party going, nothing, doting, blindness, pack my bag, concluding, back. Coffee. What a beautiful foreign country coffee used to be. What an instantly achievable mark of difference and superiority to say, you call this coffee? This isn't coffee. Let's go around the corner for a real Spanish cafe con leche and toasted buttered bread. How good it was to get high so fast and how easy it was to maintain and how skinny I got and how familiar with heartburn. The summer of the NEH grant, the room the college chipped in as a kind of matching grant was unair conditioned and concurrently occupied by roaches. All July and August, I would go down the street with Max, who was also staying in the city over the summer, and we would sit in the air-conditioned coffee shop drinking bottomless coffee and writing exquisite corpses until closing time, by which point we were as jittery as the heat lightning making rickety fireworks over the Bronx and Queens. Coffee, give me more. Give me all of it. We can have it, and it's not anything significant, but we aren't getting drunk, and we're talking so much it might as well be marriage, more than marriage. We might be turning base metals into gold. Also, the apricot jam they served in a little paper cup with the croissant, that stuff was a miracle. And the notebooks filled up with what the caffeine demanded, and the days turned into bricks in a wall, separating us from productive membership in society. When I was the subject, how we or anything exists is cranky extravagance, forthright New Year's hibiscus chaos. Oh, note card on the floor. I, I can't speak to you like someone at the end of a nine-foot wall, but if you have a birthday, I will sing to you. Flashing Christmas lights, is it your yes that's many colored, or like the tree in silhouette, is it no? I am the love of a pullet for the hose man, which shines whiter than a new refrigerator. I am the color of the sweater the woman for whom I have many little feelings wears. My eyes are that color. Candle squiggle on ceiling, copper connects its way across the room as a woman whose neckline is a stone necklace lifts the shot glass candle to light her smoke. Look deep into the street, a glass of glass. The cat you have to let come to you. The arc of the moral universe bends toward who plainly say, Warm day, surrounded beauty wants catfish in restaurant meanings. The song of plaid paper and plastic around roses is step all the way in. Kid screams her head, can't take my eyes off of you, trumpet solo in Times Square. Bystander camera crew looking for the mole of the week. Governance all afternoon and context in the evening set their tuning forks on a sleeping head. Graffiti on shoulder strap. Imagine being that far gone they could actually tag you. For a dollar, I'll tell you a poem. Bad career move. Coconut oil out of control. Oh no, symmetry. Sleepy woman at a payphone. My love, never mind my love, it's your love that means. Is she gonna make it? Reeling, counting her change. New poem come up from the earth, the south, the miners. What are the questions anything asks? Education or sex? Laundry or painting? Sadness or weight gain? Computers or square feet? Laughter or knowing looks? Quasars or pinatas? Carbon dating or Bijan frise? Restocking the wilds or hovering overhead? Companion volume or appellate court? Deep or homely? Quiet or common? Reply or sonogram? Wanton abandonment or annuities? Take the annuities. Justice or victory? Tragedy or paraplus? Arabic or cellular? 
What funny thing is the caffeine persuaded you I need to see? If I had 40 youths to give this art, and each of them youngly angry and amused, I'd relegate the sidewalk sidelong crush to one or two, and with the balance make plays, movies, ways that words move, people light, match sulfur, then tears in the eyes. In constant danger of eye contact, not that anything you want is a rock star. Small stuff or clue? Remember liking the word constellation, and I was a stranger to you? The keys, receipts, candy wrappers, and the unwashed clothes of the dead? Those people locked in game. What I could need, what I was thinking, like I need a thing. Oh, so what? Do you ease an anxious smile into its case? So what zipper on a tight lace boot? So what blue jeans on old people? The crowd massed for the celebration of the year of so what? To so what, I send my resume. I show up for the interview in my interview suit. I'm casual but poised. So what, and I get along, I get the job. So what, we go walking where the oxygen flows and nothing knows either of us. You think I smile because anybody notices, but laughter as insulation is all this life sparkles to the order of we like you. I am in love does not function as an emotional declarative the way so I was getting ready for my father to die does. This doesn't have to do with truth value or even meaningful probability. Whether true or false, so I was getting ready is unarguable. Anxiety, like love, a state of looking for an object. I'm so far from the border of being in love and not being in love. Lightning is my cello of the person-place continuum. The ice sheet standing near my head is noticed. The things I notice are not the things I think about or feel. They're what gets sucked through the hole I punch in time. When I see a man sitting on a stool in front of bricks, I know I am the firing squad. Tough guy voice I parodied to get it to take me over. Doorways grinning as stupidly as I do. And when the energy is almost finished going through, we can work out a few things without the sharp point sticking out. Thanks. So in the, in the writer um, that I signed, I, I had to promise not to defame anybody, so that I had to drastically change my... Um, but I also had to promise that my, the work that I'm reading, I am the sole copyright holder. And so about the Oran Veli poems in this book, the translator of these poems, uh, Murat Nemet Najat, who's a really lovely translator and a fine poet and essayist, um, handed me these poems in his book and said, you know, I'm not really a New York poet, but I feel as though maybe Orhan Veli was a New York poet who happened to live in Istanbul in 1950. And, and I said, well, <laughs> okay. Um, but he said, try, try turning them into New York poems for me. See how it goes. So I'm going to read a few of these. Um, I don't speak Turkish. I've tried to learn a couple times. Um, and you'll see. You won't see, because I won't let you see. Çocuk, I can say. Ekmek. Ekmek is bread. That's about it. That's all I've got. Chochuk is boy and no, kid. So anyway, Oran Veli Kanik uh, was a major figure in modernist Turkish poetry and his work should be known, uh, Murat believed and I believe along with him by everybody who likes contemporary poetry. End of lecture. Life. Life could drive you crazy. Night, stars, the breeze coming off this flower-covered tree. Indoors. The window's great. Along with your four walls, you get birds going by. The ocean. In my bed in the morning, I can tell without getting up that the boats going by are shipping watermelons. The sea likes to reflect light across my ceiling. It's trying to get a rise out of me. Seaweed and fishing poles pulled up on shore remind the children who live here of nothing. Mamut the Moocher. What do I do? Every night while you're asleep, I paint the sky blue. When the sea tears, who do they get to sew it up? Yours truly. I moonlight daydreaming. I dream there's a head in my head, a belly in my belly, a foot in my foot. You have a better idea? Poem with a rapid shake. I woke up and the sun was in my heart. 
I was ruffled and shaking rapidly, like birds and leaves in a crisp breeze, all of me a flutter. That's me, birds and leaves, birds and leaves. Sunday night. Yes, now I am dressed badly, but when I pay off my debts, I'll get some fine clothes and you will still not love me. However, when I walk down your street, dre dressed in my respectable man disguise, I won't be carrying you around in my heart like this, thank God. Good and sad. It might have gotten on my nerves loving people if love hadn't taught me to get good and sad and stay that way. <laughs> Temporary insanity. Over her at last, and the world is full of girls. A new silk shirt, a hot bath, a clean shave. It's spring in peacetime. I'm in the sun. I'm in the street. Everybody's happy. Me too. Nope. You don't hear me talking about my problems because I don't know how. It's not that they're not terrible. I can think of a few people I'd wish them on. And it's not a sentimental problem like a broken heart. Nope. And it isn't exactly that I have to work at a job. It's something, though. A big, impossible something. That's Orhan Veli. I'm going to read four more poems. When you come to the end of the, I'm, I'm attending a lot of um, Orthodox Jewish services, and when you come to the end of the seventh reading, there's the maftir, which is the, everybody wind up, we're going to wake up. So maftir. Not, nothing, never, no. Sleepy sweater wear, making minimum wage, making maximum wage for a middleman in Lodi, playing bass in a dive bar in Little Rock, baiting the contender for a bit of rope-a-dope in Shreveport. It is the American way to love names. What we repeat teaches us rhetoric and calls it music. It sincerely hopes to bed us, and maybe the beach will come right up to the library with an invitation for us to grow up already. What do you say? Up for some growing? The artist goes barreling down a context. He's buffed his concept to a luster. Mayhap you will join him at the AMF for a few frames. Maybe he will tell you what you are dying to hear, which is neither here nor there. This peculiar, unpleasant space called poetry, forsooth, no worse than a nightclub, no better than a house on fire. Ah, said the American, that cannot be helped. Ah, said the American, we must be ruled by the wealthy inept. It is our heritage and birthright. All citizens are entitled to feel contempt for their leaders, and by extension for themselves, you too, sexy. <laughs> the facility finder. I was pleased to discover America. It cheered me up to hear everybody else fighting. When I finally gave my hostility a name, I started cleaning up after it like a proper pet. It felt great to make a fuzzy electrical sound. Holding my place online with the book of my 1,000 doodles gave me inordinate feelings of pride, or ordinate maybe. The sun making wavy lines on the roofs of the parking lot. The waves making a glint-covered sunset on the roof of my heart. The roofs keeping me my accustomed level of damp. It all meant one thing. Tautology is the energy source of the future. And you are the one I want beside me in the vehicle. Our hands on each other's knees. Shouting our heads off to the music. Recorded on this obsolete medium. As a low-cost way to express our earliest vibes. Kale. I hear James, but can't see him, so I call out his baby name, Jamie James, and he pops up from behind a plow bank. We walk down the driveway, past the barn to the fenced-in garden, iron rail, green metal grid, red thread for the deer. The black mama cat with the extra toes comes running past us. The ones buried in snow are insulated, James tells me, as if quoting from the pruning book. He might be. If you cut a butterfly bush down to nothing, it grows back the next year twice as high. There are five or six tall stumps of the flat variety and eight or nine low curly ones. We fill a plastic popcorn bowl and leave as much behind still growing. 
Wine from a tall, narrow glass, I write with you flowing in my pen. You are deeper than a cello and clearer than night. Thank you. There is something about Ron Paget that no one has ever quite described or explained. Something about the way Paget's words are like a food chain, but that doesn't come near to the mystery. Perhaps it can't be put into words. Those are Paget's own words, except where I substitute for the words writing and words, the words Ron Paget and Paget's words from his lovely 2002 volume, You Never Know. And I couldn't find or know, as I mauled his body of work, a better introduction than his own words to the combination of meta and charm, of knowingness and humility that characterizes his so varied, so often hybrid, and yet so lyrical oeuvre. That oeuvre, an oeuvre that could make you say, ooh, like the top of your head is taken off, or oof, as in egg, since he also translates from the French, that oeuvre of eggs and o's and small things that can hatch and chirp and fly, that oeuvre is so often so winningly unprepossessing, so invitingly compatible, both with his eminent collaborators and with the day-to-day -day flux of the dangerous, changeable world, so uninterested in taking credit for its manifest intelligence, so much all of those things that there's some irony in the position he now occupies as an internationally recognized major figure in American poetry and poetics. Perhaps the friendliest of the figures we sometimes call, perhaps misleadingly, the second generation New York school, and that label certainly should not exhaust the boons his poems can give, especially not since he also lives in Vermont. Paget famously came to New York City in the early 60s from Tulsa along with Ted Berrigan, Dick Gallup, Joe Brainerd. His now legendary first single-authored book, Great Balls of Fire, set terrific examples for poets who take the world as it comes. Mmm. I get up and am seized by the present whose presence is as a roof, fits on a house whose car is in the garage, backs out, and in the back seat, childhood is normal. Is it, though? Later in that same book, Paget appears to anticipate Generation Z slang. Father's hair is slightly canceled. What modern poetry needs, he suggests, is a good beating, again with the eggs. And it's not long before his wandering spirit finds its own little place near the obviously phony barn, anticipating his most recent work. But Paget has never been a phony. He has been and still is a delight, and he became a noted collaborator developing, for example, there's so many examples, a set of avant emblem poems or imaginary movie reviews or concise games of comic one-upmanship with Clark Coolidge in a wonderful 1990 anti-masterpiece called Supernatural Overtones. I'm just going to, I don't think he's, you're not going to read from that today, are you? Can you read one overtone? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I can't? Okay, I'm, I can't. Uh, anyway, more recently, he's been diving into a salad bowl, a medieval salad bowl, uh, joining Coolidge in the trek of New York figures north into New England, explaining how to be perfect, writing poems on commission, as some of us know, for a movie called Patterson, proposing in a love poem that I become the cigarette and you the match. I don't know if that's on Tinder. Or, uh, and recently, in his very new book, Big Cabin, holding up in a big cabin in, of course, Vermont, long enough to create the new pastoral of a poem like Timex Blur. I was going to complain, Paget says there, but sunlight just came down and hit the pond in my brain at the same time. Elsewhere, all it takes is a hook, even a small one of any color, and you're in, and we are all in with him. Ron Paget was born in 1942 and launched his literary career in high school in Tulsa. His many books of poetry and prose include memoirs of Joe Brainerd and Ted Berrigan, The Straight Line, Blood Work, How Long, a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2011, and a 2013 collected poems which won the LA Times Book Prize. He has directed the St. Mark's Poetry Project and also taught poetry writing for students of various ages and also, as we've just heard, 
done a lot for teachers and writers. In 2018, he won the Poetry Society of America's Robert Frost Medal for, of course, lifetime service to American poetry. And he continues to dwell, I think, both in New York and in Vermont. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to listen here in Lamont Library to Ron Padgett. Well, thanks everyone for coming tonight, and um, thanks for, to Christina Davis for inviting Jordan and me, and um, it's a great pleasure to read with Jordan, because he's uh, one of the younger, although increasingly less younger, uh, <laughs> poets that I have long admired. <clears throat> I, I'm going to read entirely from the, this uh, new book of mine, <clears throat> called Big Cabin. Um, it's a series of poems that I wrote um, out of a, a kind of a crazy impulse. That is to say, I was up in Vermont, um, kind of rural Vermont, as a matter of fact, up in the woods, uh, and a friend of mine owns a property there with a five-acre pond and a beautiful little old-fashioned cabin on it, very, very simple, almost primitive. And... Um, it's a very beautiful setting, uh, somewhat isolated. And I thought to myself one day, looking at the cabin, oh, that's the kind of place that a, a, you'd think a poet would go and write poetry. What a, what a romantic and uh, somewhat outdated idea. And uh, it, it's a really, actually kind of a stupid idea for me. Therefore, <laughs> I'm going to do it and just see what happens. So over the course of three Octobers, consecutive Octobers, I went to that cabin early in the morning and, and uh, sat down and wrote poems. And uh, these are, this is a selection from the, uh, uh, the, the pieces I wrote over those three, those three autumns. Big Cabin. I like it here in this cabin. I like looking out the window at the pond and the trees beyond and with quiet inside. Sixty years ago, I was a boy with a baseball glove in Oklahoma, looking down at it and knowing I would give it away and not buy a new one. That's the only boo-hoo poem in the collection. <laughs> and truly, we use italics to put electricity into words. Then we plug lamps into the words. That's how we light our homes. Really? <laughs> Chickadee. The chickadees went away a few months ago delightful little things. Now they're back, chattering away. Wait for me. I'm the biggest chickadee in the world. Glump, glump. <laughs> Thin. My skin has grown thinner, as thin as the paper on which I write. Sometimes I accidentally cut myself and don't even know it. A thin line of blood is there. It's hard to talk to. People. People are so fucking nutty, it's amazing we get through the day without one of them undoing the parts of his body and then putting them back together in the wrong places right in front of us. <laughs> Sandwich. I'm in a cabin about 300 yards from my house in the woods on a cold, damp day, sky overcast, bright gray. At home, in the fridge, 
is sliced ham, I will put between two slices of bread with mustard and raise the ensemble to my mouth and go chomp, a chomp 300 yards away. Hope. Is there any hope for you or anyone else? Sure there is. But hope for what? Hope isn't for anything. It's just a big bunch of feeling. And <clears throat> the next one, oddly enough, sort of, de de sort of jumped into the sequence somehow. <laughs> I don't know. It almost doesn't belong there, but it does. It's called Harold Clough. In 1895 or thereabouts, Harold Clow was born in East Callis, Vermont. I knew him for the last, oh, 25 years of his life, and deep into that time, I thought to talk with him with a tape recorder running. I never did. You will never hear his voice saying anything. What a dope I am. When he started driving a car, there was no such thing as a driver's license. He was under five feet tall, with huge hands and feet, and his hair stuck out from beneath his dirty baseball cap like quills on a porcupine. It didn't bother him to hold live wires, and he could find water with a stick or coat hanger. It didn't matter which. The skin on his hands was so tough he could just reach in and take a pie out of the oven. He showed me how to hold a nail and at the same time to drive it in with a hammer using only one hand. Around 80, <clears throat> he discovered Playboy. <laughs> Amazed that he could see those girls all totally naked and glowing right there. He once mailed a donut to my dog. <laughs> he knew how to lift a barn all by himself. One day I got a call from a friend who said, old Harold just died in the hospital, heart attack. An hour later, the friend called back. Harold ain't dead. <laughs> he come back to life. <clears throat> Not only that, when the nurse returned, he was sitting up and smiling. A few years later, he really did die of a fire in the house he was born in. I once asked him for his mailing address. Oh, you can put Harold Clough, East Callis, Vermont, or Harold Clough, Adamant, or North Montpelier, Woodbury, or Callis. Don't matter none. It'll get to me. <clears throat> Thank you. All that was true, by the way. I mean, it's just <clears throat> uh, the next poem uh, uh, makes a reference to uh, the artist Fairfield Porter and to the French poet Blaise Sandrard. It's called In the Winter of 1969-70. In the winter of 1969-70, I went out to an old shed behind Fairfield Porter's house and fired up the coal stove, cleared a spot on a workbench, sat down, and started translating the poetry of Blaise Sandrar. Sometimes the room got so hot, I'd open the door wide open, and outside snow was falling. It was one of the happiest times of my life. And it still is. This, <clears throat> this uh, poem is called Paul Eloire, the French surrealist poet. <clears throat> Paul Eloire said, there is another world, but it's in this one, or something to that effect. I would say, everything is odd enough as it is, or something to that effect. My handwriting, for example, 
and my hand writing. Hand, say hello to Paul Elwar. It's good. It's good to have a heater you can hold your hands in front of to get them warm enough to hold a pen to write, it's good to have a heater. And to feel the warmth spreading into your knees and down your shins, though you can't do much with them in a sitting position. They're just down there being shins. <laughs> <clears throat> Ticking and talking. When people say, time is running out, I see an alarm clock with a bell on top and with arms and legs dashing out the door of a room in which time has stopped reminding the human race that we are running out. I carry this idea to a corner of the room and set it down gently. I don't want to wake it up. Then I tiptoe away. Sweeping away. Sweeping away. What I want to do is to forget everything I ever knew about poetry and sweep the pine needles off the cabin roof and watch them fly away into this October afternoon. The pen is mightier than the sword, but today, the broom is mightier than the pen. Poem. You're here. And if you relax for a moment, your back and other parts will arrive and you can be together with yourself. A little happiness. The porcupine, no otters in this book, but <laughs> the porcupine. If you've ever come face to face with a porcupine, you know how beast-like they look. But to the porcupine, you are of very little interest, like a stone on the ground. Though, unlike a stone, you wave your arms and shout, hey! The porcupine swivels his head and waddles a few feet away. He isn't very funny. <laughs> Wrist watch. I've just written six or seven short poems in about half an hour in a cabin on a pond with raindrops. Maybe I should just sit here for a while, let some time pass so my wife will think I've been working hard. See that? Some time just went past, but so quietly you might have missed it. It morphed into the sky. Look, another one. It came out of my wristwatch and morphed away. These poems seem a lot crazier than when I wrote them. I, <laughs> <laughs> Almost statue. Am I going to end up liking myself? It could go either way. But is it important, liking oneself? Well, it helps, but it involves a lot of self. What would I be without my self? Maybe a statue. But what's the point of being a statue? Maybe I could be part me, part statue. Is that possible? Yes, for a psycho or a saint. Timex blur. I was going to complain about how irritating it is to have to change one's clock twice a year and not understand why, but sunlight just came down and hit the pond in my brain at the same time. Things to do. Today, collect trash, put in truck, take to dump, sweep out truck bed, feel love for truck, 
then do other things I am supposed to do, but can't, uh, fortunately, remember now. What I remember now is from a moment ago, seeing my father appear in my mind's eye, then not. Shanghai Cutout. Charlie Chaplin is on the wall up near the ceiling, a paper cutout of him, about 10 inches tall and hinged at the joints in his little tramp costume, held up there by a nail through a hole in his hat. I stayed at the Astor House Hotel in Shanghai as he once did, though of course it was a different Shanghai and I was a different cutout. Haiku. First, calm down. Next, stay that way for the rest of your life. <laughs> Sideways guy. I happened to catch a glimpse of myself in an old mirror, cruddy and mottled, uh, the mirror, not me, Late medieval old guy turned slightly and stopped, black stocking cap sticking up and eyes not exactly dead but lacking the quickness of youth, fixed on you as if on someone you don't care about one way or the other. People versus leaves. Clever and powerful people have taken control over my life, but for some reason, I don't care, for I have that pile of leaves over there. Those people are wasting their lives day after day. For a moment, I feel sorry for them, but then I look at the leaves and don't care what happens to humanity. But if humanity disappears, who will read this poem? Fuck. <laughs> More about Whitehead, <clears throat> Alfred North Whitehead. Was it Whitehead who said that there is no distinct line between one's body and the air around it? That along the boundary, atoms are constantly being exchanged? I knew one of his students, Ann Porter. Maybe some of his atoms stuck to her and decades later got transferred to me. What a charming thought <laughs> and idiotic. <laughs> the Triumph of Beavers. Is there any evidence that a surrealist ever saw a beaver? I know it's a trivial question, but I'm wondering. I imagine the face of a surrealist and the face of a beaver as they suddenly see each other. They turn and run. That night, the surrealist has horrible nightmares of the face of the beaver. The beaver sleeps pretty well. Uh, there, there are two more. Um, I'll preface this one by saying that I gave a reading in China a couple of years ago and uh, at a university, and there were like 500 Chinese students there, all totally riveted on whatever poet they were listening to in this festival. And um, they were just crazy about poetry and about very fascinated by Westerners. So... Anyway, this poem is sort of set there. It's called Hai Hush. When the crowd of Chinese girls clamored for my autograph, I gave it happily, stunned, in a calligraphic script, as if I were writing in Chinese on a long scroll that called for a long unrolling my name, ending with a fluid whoosh across the sky. And up I went into the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
And the last poem <clears throat> is called Telegram. This morning about four, I was lying in bed thinking about how I'd be here in this cabin scribbling away and how the lines go as far as the words make them go. Finally, I got up and went down and made oatmeal, toast and tea, jasmine, to put a little bit of china into me and wake me up like a real human who does whatever he has to do. Like stop. Thank you. Thank you.